So Emily St. John Mandel was recently here in town. Her book Station Eleven was recently selected for the One Book One community here in Kitchener. Ours is in fact the longest running OBAC in all of Canada, now celebrating its 14th year. The event culminated with an author reading at our local library here in town. It was a pretty diverse crowd, with people ranging anywhere from 15 to 85, though I have to say it skewed way over onto the gray hair range. It's kind of nice to go to one of these events and feel like the young person in the room. The evening itself opened with a pair of actors coming on stage, and they were from the Driftwood Theatre Group. It's a traveling company that actually does a lot of Shakespearean plays outside, and it seems an apt intro to the evening's event. Now, as they were going through their paces, I kept expecting the actor playing King Lear to topple over on stage, and someone from uh, the audience to jump on and administer CPR, but that never happened. Instead, Lear played against the young lady, who was in turn Goneril, Regan, as well as the Fool. They did an abridged version of King Lear, jumping from scene to scene, and they kept a really galloping pace, but it was still very compelling and moving. They did a fantastic job, and it was a perfect way to warm up the audience for the evening's event. Emily was introduced, and she was interviewed that evening by our local symphony conductor, Edwin Outwater. They spent some time talking about the clash of low and high culture, the idea of this traveling symphony in Emily's book that would go around playing Shakespearean plays, but having a line from Star Trek Voyager pasted on the lead wagon saying survival is insufficient. It's the idea that we need the arts, even or especially in grim times, and that's been proven over and over again in our own histories. Edwin recounted a story of being at a dinner party and being accosted by one of the guests who said he would never in good conscience donate money to arts or culture, not when there were still textbooks needed in high schools. And I mean, what you do with your philanthropic dollars is your business, but at the same time, he was being antagonistic. So Edwin retorted with, well, what inspired you growing up? Which actually took the fellow aback a bit. The thing is, you can bet that it was an Intro to Calculus 5th edition. Maybe it was The Clash's London Calling, or Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrug, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. I mean, you don't know what form inspiration is going to take. For a lot of people, it could be a Beethoven symphony, but just as easily Britney Spears' work bitch. And I myself still draw lots of inspiration from Bill Waterston's Calvin and Hobbes comic. In the book, Emily talks about the crowds wanting what was best in the world. The Traveling Symphony could have easily performed episodes of Friends or The Simpsons, but they opted for Shakespeare. But it's also very apt in that Shakespeare in its time was populist culture. It was something that everyone went to see, and his was a life defined by the plague. The theaters were shut down by the bubonic plague, which also took the life of his son at 11. What's odd, though, is that she doesn't talk too much about literature in this future apocalyptic space. And instead, the characters are looking for people magazines and entertainment rags and carrying around a comic book, which would be considered low culture. So I read Station Eleven about a year ago, and I liked it well enough, but I thought I'd reread it again in preparation for the event. This time out, without having to worry about the different plot threads and the character narratives and their arcs, I could actually concentrate on the story itself, and I have to say I enjoyed it a heck of a lot more the second time around. Mendel writes with this wonderful visual style. The book opens with Arthur Leander dying on stage at the Toronto Theatre underneath blue light as fake snow descends on him. Later on, we see Jeevan wandering around Toronto on his own and seeing the bright lights of a glass greenhouse as the snow falls outside. You have this echoed in the snow globe that's given to Kristen early in the book and is carried throughout. And later on, in the glassed-in enclosure of the airport, with the people inside watching the snow fall on an abandoned airplanes. And the comic Station Eleven is also uh, a bit of a touchstone that's carried throughout and echoes different characters' moments throughout the story itself. I mean, if I have a quibble, it's the fact that some of these threads that are introduced early on in the book aren't resolved in a way that I found satisfying. And I mean, that's my own problem. Maybe I'm missing the point in Emily's subtle art. But I thought, well, you're going to introduce Arthur Leander early on as King Lear. He has three wives that echo the three daughters that he has in the play, but I don't see that carried through in the rest of the story. Or even the episode of Voyager, where the quote, survival is insufficient, those elements aren't carried throughout either. And even those visual things that I found so beautiful early on, like the snow falling down, I wanted them to be echoed somewhere at the end, so I could get this sort of, I don't know, wonderful feeling of resolution. The ending itself was good, I just wanted something more. I wanted all those threads and those motifs that were dropped early on to somehow be resolved and carried together. Maybe that's just being greedy. 
What I like about these events is I get a lot of author insight into the process itself. Emily talks about keeping an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of the different character arcs in the story as she jumps from time to time and character to character. And so she needed something to keep track so that there wouldn't be too long of a gap before she returned to Jeevan. She also talks about listening to lots of Max Richter during the writing of the novel and her editing process that found her reading the entire story out loud as one of the editing reviews. Even better, I got Emily to sign my copy of the book, which joins my copy of Headhunter, signed by Timothy Finley, uh, Essex County, signed by Jeff Lemire, and Where the Air is Sweet, signed by Tasneen Jamal. So, do you guys go for author signings? Is that a big deal? Do you actually prize these signed books? And if you do, what is your most prized book signed by an author? Let me know in the comments below.